All right, well, we have been talking uh, over these weeks about how to pursue personal and purposeful relationships. Um, Relationships that are not shallow or trivial, uh, and relationships that can move people mutually toward Christ. These kinds of relationships are commanded in the Bible by the use of a repeated phrase, one another. So love one another, bear with one another, forgive one another, encourage one another. And even when the phrase is not explicitly used, um, we are still called to listen to one another and point each other toward hope and discern uh, spiritual needs in one another. And we've been looking at these uh, over these weeks because we want to be a church body that is characterized by personal and purposeful relationships. We've been spending these Wednesday nights on the how-tos, um, the how-tos of the one another's. And so tonight we're going to look at one more uh, of, of those. And it is found and exemplified in Scripture in multiple, multiple places, but none more explicit than in James 5.13. You see that... Is it 16 or 13? I think it's 16, actually. Um, uh, None more explicit than in James uh, 5.16. It says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now, in this passage, there's actually two one another's. We're only going to look at one of them tonight, and it's the second one of the pair, and that is pray for one another. We are called to pray for one another. This probably comes as no surprise to many of you. Praying for one another is common practice within churches and church families sharing prayer requests and and keeping prayer lists or prayer journals with people's names and needs associated with them is regular practice. But how should we be praying for one another? How should we be doing that? Just because churches are doing or have been doing something for a long time doesn't mean that it's been done right. It's good to question what we do, and hold it up to the Word of God. We may find that it lines up just fine with the Bible, or we may find that there is disagreement between commandment and custom, between doctrine and doing, between the Word and the work. Well, in that case, we are obligated to change what we do, regardless of how accustomed we are or have become in doing it. Um, Or if we're not doing it, then we ought to begin doing it. So, let's let's get into this. What does Scripture say about how uh, to pray for one another? Well, the first one that I want to share with you really comes from this verse in James, and that is um, pray for material and physical needs material and physical needs. Now, this verse has um, traditionally and and probably in the vast majority uh, been interpreted as a call to pray for physical healing. Now, there is, I'm just going to briefly touch on this, there is some question as to if that is exactly what it's saying or if that is simply what it could be saying. Um, so I would say that we are within, uh, within a majority percentage that it might be saying that. So we'll just leave it, leave it right there. Uh, but then in addition to that, certainly the Lord's Prayer contains the line, give us today our daily bread. Now it is appropriate to pray for material needs that God would provide and for physical health. But there are a couple of critical understandings that we must keep straight about prayer um, that I think are going to help us have a measured approach to this first point of praying for material and physical needs. Now, the first is this. Prayer is not a means 
to get God to do what we want. Prayer is not a means to get God to do what we want. All right? We do not go to God in prayer to convince or persuade or to badger Him enough to give us what we want. That is not what prayer is for. It is not what prayer is about. Prayer is not about trying to get God onto our agenda, but rather it is more about us getting on God's agenda. You see, when we pray, and especially when we pray repeatedly, we have the benefit, and I think this is part of the benefit, we have the benefit of hearing the words come out of our mouth, right? And we are promised that those words, or those thoughts, I should say, perhaps, are heard by the holy God of the universe and our King and Creator. Now, as we consider that, we ought to carefully and, and humbly regard what requests we make of Him. Now, certainly He has promised to hear us, but He has only promised to grant what is prayed in His name. And that means according to His will. It's not a, it's not a phrase that you tack on as sort of a gotcha at the end, you know. Uh, dear, dear God, uh, uh, please let me win the, the lottery in Jesus' name. No, we don't get to play it like that. Now, God is eager to hear our desires. He wants to hear what is on our hearts. But as we repeatedly cry out to Him, it should shape our desires. As we hear these requests going before the King of the universe, it should shape them into His desires. And then ultimately, we should be more than satisfied to pray like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. Prayer is not about going to the Lord to get Him to do what we want. It could be said that prayer is the means by which we shape our wants into His. Now, the second important and critical truth uh, to, to understand, particularly in regard to this first point, that prayer uh, to, to pray for material and physical needs, is that this kind of prayer is the exception and not the rule in Scripture. This kind of prayer, praying for material needs, praying for physical needs or physical health, is the exception and not the rule. As we survey uh, numerous prayers and examples of prayers and, and even instruction to pray in the Bible, we find that praying for physical healing and praying for the provision of material things is in a stark minority. Overwhelmingly, the prayers recorded for us have to do with issues far different than material possessions and physical health, and I would argue far more important. And so in the time that we have remaining, I would like to consider several prayers recorded for us in Scripture, and as we go through them, I want to try and identify a couple of main themes and certainly uh, ones that we can with great confidence, pray for one another. And so I invite you to take that second sheet that I gave you that has these verses on them, and we can look at them, and the Scriptures are listed here um, on the page. So if you want to jot some notes there, you can. Otherwise, we're just going to go through these. The first is found in the, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and it's in his opening chapter, uh, just after the greeting and, and praise be to God, and um, uh, he's blessed us in the heavenly realms, and he gets down here, and, and then he says, "'For this reason I have heard of your faith 
Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And then starting in verse 17, this is where kind of the his prayer for them or what he has been praying for them, he then shares with them, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the heavenly places. And it goes on to talk about Christ a little bit more, but we'll stop right there. Now, there are several different things that he prays for uh, the uh, believers in Ephesus, but I want to point out two, and then I want to see them repeated over and over as we go through these next um, uh, passages. The first one is, is this, that Paul prays for them to have knowledge of God. Knowledge of God. Do you see that right in the very beginning there in verse 17? The the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you what? The spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. The first thing that Paul prays for them is that they might know God. Right? This has been said many, many times by uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones and by uh, A.W. Tozer that the most important thing about a person is what they believe to be true about God. The most important thing, the thing that is going to shape you the most, that's going to determine your future, that is going to dictate your actions, is what you believe to be true about who God is. And not because they said so, but I think even more importantly, Paul, in his prayer and in his prayers, he leads off with that you would know God. Wisdom of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Furthermore, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. That's a weird phrase, the eyes of your hearts, right? Some of you have... uh, have small children, and then maybe they do crafts or something, and they, and they cut out a heart, and they put googly eyes on it, right? Is that what we're talking about, googly eyes on your heart? No. no. But eyes are the way that we grasp things, the, the way that we capture uh, things, and our heart is, is, the, is the control center of our life. It shapes our desires and our wants and our motivations. So that we might be able to capture an understanding within the inner workings of our being, right? Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, opened, that you may what? Know. That you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, right? So Paul begins by praying that they would have a knowledge of God. And not only who He is, but what He does as well. Now this continues, in fact, in verse 19, we see um, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened to know the hope, to know the riches, and to know what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. Or other translations also say, in us who believe, right? Or for us, through us. So the second, well, which is number three on your page, but the second of this pair is to pray for strength to walk in righteousness and love, right? Paul prays that they might have a knowledge of the immeasurable greatness of his power For believers, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Now, if we don't move on, we might run out of time, so let's move on. Now, in the same letter to the uh, Ephesians, in the same letter to the Ephesians, he breaks into prayer again, 
Okay? And this is in chapter 3 now, starting in verse 14. And he says, it's for this reason. Now, he had just got done in chapter 2 talking about a wonderful discourse on the gospel. Right? And he says, now, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be what? Strengthened. There it is. Strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you might be rooted and grounded in love. So again, he's praying that they might have strength to walk in love. And then what's it say? In verse 18, also that you may have strength to what? Comprehend, to know with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So again, in the same letter to the same audience, he prays for the exact same thing. He prays that they might know God, they might know His love, and they might be strengthened to walk in love. All right, let's consider the next one. Let's consider Colossians um, chapter 1. Now, this is to a different church, right, uh, in, in different circumstances. And in chapter 1, this is Paul's typical um, pattern. He has an he a, a introduction and a brief greeting. Um, and barring any other um, important things to uh, mention, he usually uh, informs them of how he has been praying for them. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you might be filled with what? The knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Right? So that they might know God. That they might be growing in their knowledge and wisdom and understanding of who God is. And verse 10 almost gives it away before it really uses the word, so as to what? Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then 11 says what? Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who qualified you. Now, I could probably also say, uh, pray that they would be grateful or have gratitude as well. That seems to be a recurring theme, but not in all of these. And so I wanted to narrow in on just the, just the main two. And so we see it again. Paul prays that they would know who God is and that they would be strengthened to walk in righteousness and in love. Let's look to Philippians now. Again, a different group of people in different situations, right? In a different setting, in different circumstances. And yet, what do we see? In verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with what? Knowledge and discernment so that you might be able to approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now this one isn't as explicit, but it's still there. Paul is praying that their love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. It is assumed uh, that he's talking about knowledge of God and that filled with the, with the fruit of righteousness, right? That they might have the strength to bear fruit, that they might walk in righteousness and love. Now, I particularly included Philippians because later in Philippians, in fact, just after this and then later in a couple chapters, um, I want to I wanna compare... Paul's attitude toward material things and 
um, temporal circumstances. Okay? And I say that because, and I don't want to spoil the ending too much, but I say that because if left unchecked, I think that our tendency is to focus our prayers on the physical things, the temporal things. And I want you to see, even though Paul is enduring some pretty serious circumstances, what is his attitude? And, and, and how, does he, how does he pray about those things? Well, let, let's, let's look down here in Philippians 1, 19 through 21. Now he says, Now, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Okay, so it's assumed. Now, Paul is in prison at this time. He's under house arrest. He's writing this from Rome. It's, it's assumed. And, um, and, and he has a hope of being let out of prison and returning to see them and, and continue on a missionary journey. That's his prayer. That's his hope. Okay, that's his desire. When he first got locked up, I'm sure his first desire was, God, you got to get me out of here. You know, but let's see if, if that's just where he lands. So through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. What does he mean by deliverance, right? It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What we read there, does Paul seem desperate that he has to get out of prison? Does, is, is Paul desperate that God would do what Paul wants God to do? God, you got to get me out of here. You got to get me out. Everybody's got to start praying. You got to get me out of here. No. He says, pray that I might have sufficient courage. Sufficient courage that I will not be ashamed. And that however this turns out, it's for my deliverance. I'll either be let out or I will die and I will be face to face with my Savior. But either way, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, Paul goes on from here and he, and he talks about how he's torn between the two and he's like, look, I, to die and get out of here, oh man, life's been tough, I'm ready. <laughs> but if I got to stay, it'll be fruitful labor for me. That's fine. But either way, I'm fine. He is not obsessed. He is not desperate. He is not overwhelmed. He is not hyper-focused on the temporal issues. He's like, if you're going to pray for me, pray that I won't be ashamed. Pray that I'll remain faithful. Now, let's look in chapter 4 of, verse, of, uh, of Philippians. Now, he's, he's talking about, he's, he's thanking them for their gift. He sent a, they, they as a church sent a gift to him. And he's like, hey, thank you. This is great. I appreciate it. You know, but really, it's not about me. You don't have to worry about me because I have learned that in, in whatever situation, how to be content. Right? Verse 11. Now, verse 12. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In every circumstances, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. It's this. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Right? This isn't about climbing a mountain. This isn't about some feat of strength. This is about enduring when things don't go the way that you wish. What is Paul's attitude toward material needs? Not the most important thing. Whatever God has me to face, I will face it in the strength that He provides for me to walk in righteousness and love. Now, as we wrap up, I want to leave you with a couple of things to ponder as you seek to apply this 
to your own lives and relationships. Okay? The first is this. What we pray for reveals to us what is most important to us. That's quoted by a very famous theologian there. Um, <clears throat> no, I just... It, it, was, it was me. It was me. <laughs> no, I... I think that captures well this sentiment, right? If our prayer lists are full of physical problems and material needs with little mention of requests for spiritual strength or knowledge of God, what does it say about what we value? You've heard the one about the uh, uh, church that met for a prayer meeting and an organ recital broke out? Yeah? No? Someone wanted to pray for someone's lungs and then someone's liver and someone's kidneys and someone's... That's humor, in case you, in case you, didn't, in case you missed that. Anyway, you were right. Yeah, you were right. That was bad. <laughs> what does it say about what we value when the only thing that we pray about, the only thing that makes up our prayer lists are physical and material needs. When you hear of a need or when you hear of someone experiencing some suffering, where does your mind go first? That the suffering would stop? That the illness would be healed? Or that this person might do all things through Christ who provides the strength? Now, at Solid Rock, we keep and we publish an ongoing prayer list that, yes, is largely made up of those people who are enduring some kind of suffering, be it physical or um, uh, uh, material needs or whatever. But as we record them, we make it a point to include a spiritual request as well. We we list what they're going through. And certainly, it is our desire, and God is eager to hear our desires and where our hearts are. And God, yes, if it be your will, please heal. Please provide. Please give relief. But God, more importantly, will you provide comfort and wisdom and patience, and peace, and encouragement, and will you help them to trust you? And will they come to a knowledge of the gospel? So as you keep your prayer list, and as you pray for one another, be sure not to simply list the ailment or the material need, but pray for the corresponding spiritual need as well. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would do a work in our hearts, that you would increase our knowledge of who you are. Lord, that, that, that our desires would, would become transformed and they would be shaped into your desires so that even, even our first inclination when we hear of suffering might be the spiritual side the spiritual need, that we might be able to echo Paul and say, whatever, life, death, hungry, full, rich or broke, we do it all through Christ. And God, we also pray for strength, strength to endure, strength to have patience and wisdom to come alongside one another as we seek to minister alongside each other, as we seek to pursue personal and purposeful relationships in this body of Christ that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.